Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We move on to the chapter of Al Wudu, ablution. And in this chapter, there are three fundamental rules. So let's take each of them one by one. Fundamental rule number one these are the obligatory aspects of the wudu. And there are four of them, so please write this down. Number one, washing your face. Number two, washing your hands all the way up to your elbows. Number three, wiping your head and number four washing your feet up to and including the ankle bone okay so let's discuss these number one washing your face what is your face lengthwise it is from the top of your forehead all the way to your chin and widthwise it is from where the air begins to the other side of the face where the air begins but it does not include the air itself washing the face also includes rinsing your mouth and your nose how do you do this? You take water into your right hand and you put some of this water into your mouth and the remaining water of the same hand you put into your nose. You rinse out your mouth and spit the water out and with your left hand you blow your nose out as if you're blowing your nose. This will thoroughly clean out the mouth and the nose. If you do not rinse your mouth and your nose out your wudu is incomplete. In the hadith of Abu Dawud it says إِذَا تَوَضَّعْتَ فَتَمَضْمَضْ When you make wudu then rinse your mouth out. Also he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said إِذَا تَوَضَّعَ أَحْذُكُمْ فَلْيَجْعَلِ الْمَاءِ فِي أَنْفِهِ ثُمَّ الْيَسْتَنْفِرْ When one of you makes wudu then let him put some water in his nose and blow out. Point number two is to wash your hands all the way up to and including the elbows you need to make sure also that you clean between the fingers so the water reaches in between the fingers also. In the hadith of Abi Dawud, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, uh, Asbigh al-wudu wa khallil bayn al-asabi' wa balig fil istinshaq illa an takuna sa'iman. Do your wudu well, meaning the water needs to reach all the necessary parts and exaggerate in putting the water up your nostrils except if you are fasting. Because of course, if you put water up your nostrils when you are fasting, then it could go into your stomach. So do put water up your nose, but don't exaggerate in doing so. The third point is wiping the head. How is this done? You make your hands wet and you wipe all of the head. So you begin from the front part of the head where the hair begins to grow and you take it all the way back to the nape till where the hair finishes growing. And then you bring it right back to the front again. All the head needs to be wiped, meaning to say that both of your hands need to cover the whole head. It does not mean to say that every single strand of hair needs to be wet because this is not possible. And then using your two index fingers you wipe inside the air and then using your thumb you wipe on the back of the air because it's part of the head. Point number four is that you clean your feet up until and including the ankle bone. All of this needs to be washed of course. The Prophet Sallallahu once saw a man and his ankles were dry so he said Woe meaning destruction to the heels from the hellfire. So the matter of wudu is extremely serious. Now there are two more obligatory aspects to the wudu and this should also be memorized. They are at-tartib which means the order. The order of washing the body parts is wajib. So you can't wash your feet before you wash your hands as your wudu will be incomplete. Why is tartib or the order obligatory? Because you have to do it in the same order as it comes in the Quran. Allah Azza says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا قُمْتُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ فَاغْسِلُوا وَجُوهَكُمْ وَأَيْدِيَكُمْ إِلَى الْمَرَافِقِ وَامْسَحُوا بِرُؤُوسِكُمْ وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْن or you believe when you stand up to do the wudu then wash your faces and then your hands up to the elbows and wipe your heads and wash your feet to the ankles so it needs to be done in this very same order the final obligatory aspect of wudu is al muwalat which means that these body parts need to be washed consecutively without any big gap in between them so for example, you cannot wash your face and then go on the telephone for half an hour and then come back and complete the rest of the wudu. Fundamental rule number 
2. And these are the conditions for your wudu to be sahih or correct. There are seven of them. So here they are. Number 1. Whatever obligates the wudu needs to come to an end first before you start making wudu. Number 2. You have to be a Muslim. Number 3. You have to have an intention. Number 4. You have to have aql, which means understanding. And number five, you have to have a tamyiz, which is you have to reach the age of distinction. Number six, you need to use purifying water. And number seven, you need to remove from your body anything that will prevent water from reaching the skin or nail. So let's go through these. Number one, anything that obligates the wudu needs to finish. So for example, is it permissible for you to be urinating and doing wudu at the same time? The answer is no, because you need to finish urinating first and then do wudu. Likewise, a menstruating woman, we know she does not pray. So is it permissible for a woman who is menstruating to make wudu? No, her menstruation needs to finish first and then she makes wudu and so on. Point number two is that you have to be a Muslim. The evidence is in the Quran in many ayat, but let's mention one of them. وَإِلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبِلِكَ لَإِنَ أَشْرَكْتَ لَيَحْبَطَنَّ عَمَلُكَ وَلَا تَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ It has been revealed to you, O Muhammad وسلم, and to those before you, if you commit shirk, all your deeds will be rendered vain and useless and you will be from the losers. Thus it becomes known that if a kafir was to do wudu, he is simply getting himself wet and there is no reward for him and this wudu will never be accepted with Allah Azza wa Jal. Point number three, a niyyah, which is intention. What is a niyyah? It is to make a firm resolution to do something. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّةِ Deeds are but by intention. So you need to have that intention to make wudu. Now intention is something easy. As soon as you enter the bathroom wanting to make wudu, you have actually made the intention. So you don't need to utter out anything or say to yourself, I now intend wudu, because this is a bidda. The place of intention is the heart. Part of your intention should also be that you are doing this act of worship as a means to gain closeness to Allah. If you don't have this, then your intention is deficient. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمَا لِأَحَدٍ عِنْدَهُ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ تُجَزَى إِلَّا بِتِغَاءَ وَجْهِ رَبِّهِ الْأَعْلَى And who has in mind no favor from anyone to be paid back except to seek the face of Allah the Most High. Point number four, Aql. The one who is Aql is the one with intellect. That's the opposite of the one who is mad. So if a madman was to make wudu, it will not be counted. Why are acts of worship not accepted from a madman? Remember we said that for the act of worship you need to have niyyah. For all acts of worship you need to have niyyah. And it is not possible for a madman to have a niyyah. Point number five is a tamyiz. The age of a tamyiz, which is distinction, is the age in which a child can distinguish between an act of worship and just a normal act. According to the correct opinion, the age of at tamyiz is seven years old because this is the age in which Rasulullah ordered the people to order their children to pray. Point number six is that you need to use purifying water. We discussed this in the chapter of water because water that is najis, impure, cannot be used to make wudu. Likewise, water that is pure but not purifying so for example, this could be Coca-Cola or coffee or tea or the like, cannot be used to make wudu. Point number seven is that you need to remove anything that will prevent water from reaching the skin. So for example, if a lady is wearing nail polish, then this needs to be removed before making wudu. The evidence for this is the hadith which we made mention of before, where the Prophet said, Asbighil wudu, make wudu well. It means that water needs to reach all the necessary body parts. If you have some oil or grease on your skin, but it is not thick enough to prevent the water from reaching the skin, then you don't need to worry about removing it. It is only the thick layers that you need to remove.
Fundamental rule number three is the sunan aspect of the wudu. These are sunnah and not wajib, but they are still part of the wudu. If you do them, is extra reward. If you don't, you don't have a punishment. So here they are. This is to write down number one to say Bismillah before you begin. Number two to use the miswak. Number three to wash your hands up until the wrist before you start the wudu. Number four to rinse your mouth and nose before you wash the face. Number five to throw water right up your nostrils except if you are fasting. Number six to pass your fingers through the thick beard. Number seven to wash the right side and then the left side. Number eight to wash two or three times but no more. Number nine to rub the body parts as you wash them and number 10 to make the dua at the end of the wudu okay let's go through these number one is to say bismillah this is due to the hadith la salata liman la wudu alahu wa la wudu a liman lam yathkur ismallah there is no salah for the one who doesn't have wudu and there is no wudu for the one who didn't mention the name of Allah now the scholars say that saying Bismillah here even though it's an order but it is recommended because the companions who describe the wudu of the Prophet they did not mention Bismillah point number two is the siwak now the evidence for this has been mentioned where the Prophet wasallam said if it wasn't for the fact that I would cause difficulty for my ummah I would order them to do siwak with every wudu and in another narration before every salah point number two is to wash your hand up into the wrist right and then left one two or three times because this has been mentioned in the narrations in which the companions describe the prophets wudu but the Quran does not order it so it remains a sunnah number three is to rinse your mouth and nostrils out before washing the face because this is the way it has been described by the companions Number four is to really throw the water up your nostrils except if you are fasting and we said because there's a danger that the water will enter your stomach. So when you're fasting you do put the water up your nose but be careful not to throw it right up the nostril. Point number six if you have a thick beard then you pass your fingers through the beard so you don't actually need to wash the beard. If your beard is light then you can wash the skin underneath it because you won't find any difficulty in doing so. Point number seven is that you wash your right limbs and then your left limbs because this is the way it has been described by the companions when they described the Prophet's wudu. And also the narration of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha when she said كان نبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يعجبه التيام في تنعله وترجله وفي شأن كله that the Prophet ﷺ would like to begin with the right first when putting on the shoes, when combing his hair and in all his affairs. So in all the affairs which are deemed to be good, you begin with the right. Also there is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ himself إِذَا تَوَضَّعْتُمْ فَابْدَأُوا بِمَيَامِنِكُمْ When you make wudu, then begin with your right side. Number eight you wash your body parts either once, twice or thrice. Once is wajib, two times or three times is sunnah because that's the way it has been described by the companions. Number nine, you rub your body parts. It would be sufficient just to throw water on the necessary body part but to rub it will be more effective in cleaning it so therefore it is recommended to rub. Number ten is to say the dua afterwards. What is this dua? أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. In Sahih Muslim it says whoever does wudu and then says this dua, the eight gates of paradise will be open for him and it would be said enter by whichever gate you wish. Let's top this chapter off with some revision questions. Number one, mention the six obligatory aspects of wudu. Question number two, if a five-year-old boy makes wudu, then is this accepted as an act of worship? 
Lastly, what is the ruling on rubbing the body limbs when you're doing wudu? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. The chapter of wiping over the khuffain, which are the leather socks. The number of ahadith which prove that you can wipe over the leather socks are very, very many indeed. Now, some scholars have also included normal socks in the same ruling, so you can wipe over normal socks, and this is correct. There are three fundamental rules in this chapter. Fundamental rule number one is the conditions for the wiping to be correct, and there are three conditions for the wiping of the hoof or the socks to be correct. Number one, you need to wear these socks or hoof after performing wudu with water. Number two, that these hoof need to cover most of the foot. And number three, that these hoofain need to be tahir, pure. Let's go through these. Number one, you need to have washed your feet with water in wudu before putting them on. The evidence for this is the time when al mughira ibn Shu'ba went to take off the khuffain of Rasulullah in order for him to do wudu. The Prophet said, Da'huma fa inni adkhaltuhuma tahiratain. Leave them, meaning leave the khuffain alone, because I put my feet in them, meaning I wore the khuffain whilst they were tahir, meaning after performing the wudu. So would it be possible for you to make tayammum which is with the dust and then put on the khuffain and then whenever the next time comes for you to perform wudu to wipe over the khuffain? The answer is no. Why not? Because when you put on your khuffain you did not make wudu with water. Point number two, it needs to cover most of the foot. So this means if the socks have some sort of hole or rupture in them, as long as they are covering most of the foot, they are permissible to be wiped over and there's no problem in doing so. Point number three is that they need to be pure. So you cannot wear these socks which are made from pig skin or any skin of an animal which is haram to be eaten because as we know, the skin is not pure, even after tanning. Add to this also that the socks need to be permissible to be worn. So it would not be permissible for a male to wear socks made out of silk because it is haram for the male to wear silk and gold. Fundamental point number two, those things which nullify the wiping over the socks. And there are three. Number one, Al Hadath al Akbar. This is being in the state of post sexual impurity. Number two, when the time limit for the wiping runs out. And number three, taking off these socks. Okay, let's run through this. Number one, Al Hadath al Akbar. In post sexual impurity, you cannot wipe over your socks. Why not? Because you have to take a bath. And in order to take a bath, you have to take off your socks. The same thing is also said with the menstruating woman. Because after her menses, she would need to take a bath. So there's no point in wiping over the socks. In the Sahih Hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا تَوَضَّعَ أَحْدُكُمْ وَلَبِسَ خُفَّيْهِ فَلْيَمْسَحْ عَلَيْهِمَا وَلْيُسَلِّ فِيهِمَا وَلَا يَخْلَعْهُمَا إِنْ شَاءَ إِلَّا مِنْ جَنَابَةٍ when one of you performs the wudu and wears the khuffain, then let him wipe over them and pray in them and he does not need to take them off except due to post-sexual impurity. Point number two is when the time limit runs out, you cannot spend the rest of your life wiping over the socks, but rather there is a time limit and we'll discuss what, what that is in a minute. Point number three, taking off the socks. If you're in a state of purity and you put on the socks and you did not break the wudu and you took your socks off and then you put your socks back on again all the while you did not break the wudu then you are allowed according to the correct opinion to wipe over these socks. Why? Because you are in a state of purity and you need evidence to suggest that you are no longer in a state of purity. So simply put, taking off the socks does not nullify the wiping as long as you kept in the state of purity. Now if you took your socks off and then you broke the wudu and then you put the socks back on, 
Are you allowed to wipe over them? The answer is no. Because one of the conditions to wipe over the socks, as we mentioned, is that you need to make wudu with water and then afterwards put on the socks. Please note also that putting on the socks needs to be done after you have washed both feet. So it is not proper to wash the right foot and then put on the right sock and then wash the left foot and then put on the left sock. But rather both of the feet need to be washed and thereafter both of the socks need to be put on. Fundamental point number three is the time limit of wiping. If you are a resident the time limit is one day and night and if you are a traveler the time limit is three days and nights. This time limit begins from the first time of wiping not the first time of actually putting the socks on. Also if your time limit expires and you have these socks on but you are still in a state of purity can you pray the next prayer? The answer is yes because you are still in a state of purity. It's just when the next time comes to make wudu you would have to take the socks off and wash your feet with water. Let us now give you some revision questions. Number one, what are the conditions for you to wipe over the socks? Number two, is it permissible for you to wipe over socks which have holes in them? Number three, I am a resident. I make my wudu and wear my socks for the Asr prayer. I then pray the Asr. When it comes to Maghrib, I make my wudu again, but this time I wipe over the socks. The question is, when does the timing for the wiping begin and when does it end for me being a resident? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We move on to the next chapter, which is those things that break the wudu. And there are two fundamental rules in this. Rule number one, the list of things which break the wudu, and there are six of them. Here's the list to be memorized. Number one, wudu is broken whenever something comes out of the two passages, the urine passage and the feces passage. Number two, sleep or whenever your intellect is lost, like fainting. Number three, touching your front private parts. Number four, eating camel meat. Number five, whenever the two circumcised parts meet, that's during sexual intercourse. And number six, arridda, which is apostasy. Okay, let's go through these. Number one, anything coming out of the urine or feces passage. Note, even if this is not urine or feces itself, it will break the wudu. Rasulullah says, لا يقبل الله صلاة أحدكم إذا أحدث حتى يتوضأ that Allah does not accept the salah of any one of you when he breaks his wudu until he does wudu. Number two, sleeping breaks your wudu or if you turn mad or faint because you don't know during this time something may have come out of the front two passages. As for slumberness or just feeling sleepy but you're still conscious, this does not break the wudu. It has been reported that the companions were waiting for Salat al usha they were sitting down and feeling very sleepy such that their heads began to shake due to the slumberness. And when the Prophet ﷺ came to lead them in prayer, they just stood up and prayed without renewing the wudu because they were still in a state of consciousness. Point number three, touching your front private parts with your hand. The Prophet ﷺ said, Man massa dhakarahu Whoever touches his penis, let him make wudu. There is a difference of opinion on this issue because there is a contradictory hadith in which a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and asked him should he make wudu if he touches his penis. The Prophet ﷺ says, Huwa bid'atun minka. He says, it is only a part of you. So he told him not to make wudu. This hadith, some scholars say, is abrogated but it is difficult to see how it could be abrogated because your front private part will always be a part of you. This can never be abrogated. So the opinion which says that it is only recommended to make wudu if you touch your front private parts is a good opinion. Point number four, if you eat camel meat, you have to renew your wudu. The evidence is in Sahih Muslim. A man comes up to the Rasulullah and asks him, shall I make wudu if I eat meat of a sheep? He said, if you want to. 
and then he asked shall I make wudu if I eat the meat of a camel and he replied yes the reason for this is because the camel is made from the same material as the jinn which has been reported and the jinn is made from fire so eating camel meat will make you fiery therefore you need to do wudu to cool you down point number five in sexual intercourse the hadith regarding this is إِذَا جَلَسَ بَيْنَ شُعْبِهَا وَجَهَدَهَا فَقَدْ وَجَبَ الْغُسُلُ وَإِنْ لَمْ يُنْزِلُ that if he sits between her arms and legs and has intercourse with her then the ghusl, the bath becomes obligatory even if he does not ejaculate so the mere penetration makes the ghusl wajib so if it makes ghusl wajib then of course it breaks the wudu point number six a ridda which is apostasy because if you become an apostate then all your actions are null and void hence your wudu is an act of worship it becomes null and void like all your other actions fundamental rule number two the person who is in a state of minor impurity is not allowed to do three things so here they are to be written down number one as salah number two at tawaf and number three touching the mushaf which is the book which contains the quran let's go through these what do we mean by a state of minor impurity it means you are in a state which you need to do wudu in order to do salah the major impurity is a state in which you need to make a full bath before you can pray so point number one if you're in a state of minor impurity you're not allowed to pray there's a consensus of the scholars in this and the hadith we have mentioned that Allah does not accept the prayer of the one who is in a state of minor impurity until he makes wudu point number two is at tawaf and the evidence is the hadith at tawaf as salah illa anna allaha abaha fihi al kalam he said the tawaf is simply salah except that Allah has permitted for you to speak in it so the scholars say because it is like a salah you need to be in a state of wudu there is a minority opinion which says that there is no clear evidence that you need to be in a state of wudu to make tawaf and that the hadith which has just been mentioned is not clear evidence that you need to be in a state of wudu but the minimum that can be said is that it is recommended for you to be in a state of wudu when you make tawaf point number three is touching the mushaf there's a big difference of opinion on this issue but the safest and best opinion is that you need to be in a state of wudu to touch the mushaf this is due to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying la yamassuhu illa tahir nobody should touch it meaning the mushaf except the one who is tahir and tahir here means in a state of wudu here are the questions for this chapter number one what are the actions which nullify the wudu Question number two, what's the evidence that eating camel meat breaks your wudu? Question number three, why is apostasy one of the actions which break the wudu? And question number four, what are the things which a person in a state of minor impurity is not allowed to do? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We move on to the chapter of Al Ghusl, which is the bath. And there are five fundamental rules in this so let's take each rule one by one fundamental rule number one those things which make ghusl wajib and there are six of them number one ejaculation of the sperm number two when the two private parts meet in sexual intercourse number three the blood of menstruation and number four the blood of annifas which is postnatal bleeding and number five when a kafir turns to Islam meaning when he accepts Islam number six when a Muslim dies okay let's go through this now the sperm needs to come out accompanied with sexual pleasure and it must be squirted out Allah Azza wa says khuliqa min ma in dafiq. he has been created from a water which shoots out if the sperm was to just trickle out then this is just some sort of medical condition and it does not obligate the bath if you see a wet dream and you wake up to find sperm then you need to perform the bath if you don't see a wet dream and you wake up and you found sperm anyway then you have to take a bath and if you were to see a wet dream 
and you woke up but you did not see or detect any sperm, then you don't need to take a bath. The evidence is the hadith of Umm Sulaim when she asked Rasulullah does a woman have to take a bath if she has a wet dream? And he said, Naam idha hiya ra'at al ma. He goes, Yes, if she sees water. Point number two is when the two circumcised parts meet in sexual intercourse, even if ejaculation doesn't take place. As we mentioned the hadith before, when he sits between her arms and legs and he has intercourse with her, then this obligates the bath, even if he doesn't ejaculate. Point number three is menstruation, because the menstruating woman doesn't pray and when her mens is finished, she needs to take a bath and then she is able to pray, not before. The evidence for this is the hadith of Fatima bint Hubaysh when she came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Inni ustuhadu fala athharu, that I am constantly bleeding and I am never pure. Afa salah, shall I leave the prayer? So the Prophet ﷺ told her, La innama huwa irqun, no, this is just a burst vein. Faida akbalat al hayda, fadari as salah, wa ida adbarat, fagsili anki adam, wasalli. That when your menses come, then leave off the prayer. And when it finishes, meaning when your regular period, whether it be six days, seven days, or however long it is, when it finishes, then you wash, meaning you take a bath, and you pray. So this proves that the menstruating woman, when her menses finishes, she takes a bath. And if there is any excess bleeding over and above her normal period, then she does not give that bleeding any consideration. Point number four is the postnatal bleeding. This takes the same ruling as menstruation. The majority opinion is that it's 40 days. If her postnatal bleeding finishes before 40 days, then she has a bath and she prays. So don't go 40 days without praying if your postnatal bleeding stops before 40 days. Point number five, when a kafir turns to Islam and accepts Islam, then he needs to take a bath. The evidence is in Sunan Abi Dawud. When Qais ibn Asim accepted Islam, he was ordered to take a bath. Point number six is when a Muslim dies, this obligates the bath. Of course, he needs to be given a bath because he can't take one himself. The whole Ummah agrees to this. If a Kafir dies, of course, we don't give him a bath. And if there is nobody to bury him and there's only Muslims available, then they will just dig a hole in the ground and fling him in. Fundamental rule number two. This is the conditions for your bath to be correct. And they are the same conditions as your wudu to be correct, but we'll mention them anyway. Number one, anything which obligates the bath needs to end before you can take the bath. Number two, your intention. Number three, al-Islam. Number four, al-aql, which is intellect. Number five, at-tamyiz, which is the age of distinction. Number six is purifying water. And number seven, anything in your body which will prevent the water to reach your skin needs to be removed first. Let's go through this. Number one, for example, menstruation obligates the bath. So the woman needs to make sure that her menses finish before she can take the bath. She cannot take the bath during her menses. Number two, intention. Your actions are but by intention. So if you're in a state of major impurity and you're walking along a bank and somebody kicks you into the water and you fall in, have you entered into a state of purity because all your body has been washed? The answer is no. Why not? Because you didn't make the intention. Point number three is Al-Islam. This is because acts of worship can never be accepted from a kafir. Allah Azza wa says, وَلَقَدْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكَ وَإِلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ لَإِنْ أَشْرَكْتَ لَيَحْبَطَنَّ عَمَلُكَ وَلَا تَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ It has been revealed to you, O Muhammad, and to those before you, if you commit shirk, all your deeds will be rendered vain and useless. Point number four is Al-Aql intellect because no deeds can be accepted from a madman as we made mention before a mad person cannot have a niya point number five at tamyiz this is the age at which a child can distinguish 
an act of worship from just any other act and we made mention before that this is the age of seven because the Prophet said that children should be ordered to pray at the age of seven and they should be beaten to pray at the age of ten. Point number six, purifying water because if the water is impure it cannot purify you, it is itself impure and as for that which is pure but not purifying like tea or coffee then this cannot be used to perform the ghusl. Point number seven, if you have thick layers of grease or wax on you which will prevent the water from reaching the skin then this needs to be removed because the whole point about taking a bath is that the water needs to touch the whole body. Fundamental point number three, this is the obligatory aspect of taking the bath and there's only one thing to note here and this is the whole body must be touched with water. So if you make your intention and jump into the bath so that the whole body is touched with water and then you climb back out so it's a 10 second job then you have performed the bath. Fundamental point number four, these are the sunnah elements of the bath i.e. the recommended elements of the bath. There are seven of them so this is to be memorized. Number one, removing any dirt from the body. Number two, making a complete wudu except washing the feet. Number three, washing each limb in the wudu three times. Number four, washing the right side of your body first and then the left side. Number five, al-mu'alat which is everything needs to be done consecutively. Number six, rubbing and number seven to wash your feet afterwards. Let us run through the description of the bath of the Prophet وسلم, as described by Aisha in Sahih Muslim. First of all he washed his private parts of any unwanted substances. Then he made the wudu as usual except he did not wash his feet. Then he washed his head by rubbing underneath the hair until he thought that he had covered the whole of the head. It is also recommended to wash the head three times. Then you pour the water over the rest of your body washing the right side first and then the left side. You don't need to do this three times, only the head is recommended three times. Also remember it is recommended to rub the body because this will be more effective at cleaning it. The Prophet would then wash his feet in a separate place. Once you've done this you are ready to perform the Salah and you don't need to make a new Wudu. If a woman is taking a bath from her menses then it is recommended for her to perfume her private part and then make the bath. If she has braided her hair then she will have to undo the braid and then take the bath. If she is performing the bath due to post sexual impurity then she does not have to undo the braid. So notice the difference between taking a bath from post sexual impurity and taking a bath from the menses. Fundamental rule number five. These are times when the bath is recommended and they are as follows. Number one, whoever washes a dead person he should himself take a bath. Number two, at the times of Eid. Number three, when you recover from fainting. Number four, when a madman turns sane. Number five, taking a bath for every prayer for a woman who has extended bleeding over and above her menses. Number six, when entering into Ihram for the Hajj. Number seven, when entering Mecca. And number eight, when standing at Arafah. Okay, let us go through these. Please note that the bath on Yawmul Jumu'ah is wajib. Due to the hadith, Man ja'a minkum Yawmul Jumu'ah fal yaghtasil. Whoever comes to Yawmul Jumu'ah, meaning the prayer Yawmul Jumu'ah, let him take a bath. And also the hadith in the Sahih, Al Ghusl Yawmul Jumu'ah wajibun li kulli muhtalim that to take a bath on Yawm al Jum'ah is wajib for every adult. Let's go through this list. Number one, whoever washes the dead person, this is due to the hadith, Man ghassala mayyitan fal yaghtasil, whoever washes the dead person, then let him take a bath. This is an order but it is a recommendation because there's a contradictory hadith, Laysa alaykum al ghusl min ghusl al mayyit, that a bath is not obligatory upon you if you wash the dead person. Number two, taking a bath on the two days of Eid. This is because Ibn Umar used to do this and he was very eager to follow the Sunnah. Number three, when you recover from fainting, this is because the Prophet ﷺ did this nearing the end of his life. He fainted and recovered, then he took a bath and he fainted again and then he recovered and took a bath. 
and he ordered Abu Bakr to lead the people in the prayer. Number four, when a madman regains his sense, this is due to analogy from the previous point. Point number five is when you take a bath for every salah for the woman who has excess bleeding over and above her menses. This is because Umm Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha did this. However, this could be very difficult for the woman. So if she made wudu for every prayer, then this will suffice her. Point number seven, when you enter into the state of ihram, because in Sunan At-Tirmidhi it is reported that the Prophet ﷺ, when he was entering into the ihram, he took his clothes off and took a bath. Point number seven, before entering Makkah, this is because Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, when he was entering into Makkah, he spent the night in a place called the Tuwa, and he took a bath, then he entered into Makkah by daytime. And he mentioned that the Prophet wasallam did this. Point number eight, when standing at Arafah, it is reported in Imam Malik's al muwatta which is the famous hadith collection, that Ibn Umar took a bath for Arafah. Here are the questions for this chapter. Question number one, what are the times in which taking a bath is obligatory and make mention of any evidences? Question number two, what are the conditions for the bath to be correct? Question number three, when a mad person recovers and regains his senses, what's the justification that he should take a bath? Question number four, please describe the recommended way to take a bath and mention the difference between the bath of menstruation and the bath of post-sexual impurity for the woman.